in the Old Testament. Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. It says, remember the former things, those of long ago. I'm God, and there's no other. I'm God, and there's none like me. So I always like saying this about God. There's an exclusivity concerning God. I am, and that's just, just, just it. He's not one of many gods. He's not many paths to God. He says, I am. So he says, I make known, I like this, I make known the end from the very beginning. From the ancient times, what is still to come. So in the very beginning, he said, in ancient times, I, I, I made known what is yet to come. I say, all right, I speak, my purpose will stand. I will do all that I please. I begin in the book of Genesis, the third chapter. This would just be one of those prophecies, and it's fulfilled in, in many different ways. But I want to begin in Genesis 3rd, verses 14 and 15. And this is right after the fall of mankind. Man has sinned against God. He's partaken of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, uh, and so now God has, has come and he's, he's, he's asked Adam and Eve, he says, you know, what have you, what have you done? And so this is God's, this is his punishment. So the Lord said to the serpent, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. So he's speaking what to Satan or the serpent. I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now we notice and I've underlined her seed. Because why? Because Christ does not have an earthly father. He has a heavenly father. He's born of a virgin. So it's her seed. And he, saying that she'll have what? A son, all right, will bruise your head. But it does say that you'll bruise his heel. See, Jesus was wounded. He was bruised. He was afflicted, okay? But when he raised from the dead, he crushed Satan's head. Because sin and death no longer had power over him. So that is the first prophecy concerning Christ and our redemption. Now the birth of Christ was planned before the world ever began. 1 Peter 1.20 reads this way, He was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Now, Peter is speaking of Christ. He was the one that was chosen before the creation of the world. God had a plan of redemption. He was always going to send forth his son. He chose him before the creation of the world. Remember, he reveals the end. All right, he reveals the, he, <clears throat> excuse me, he reveals the end from the very beginning, before the very creation of the world but was revealed in the last times for your sake. Now, the prophecies concerning Christ, that God, it shows us this. It reveals that God has both the design, all right? It's like he drew it out. It's sketched. Or he has a plan. He has, a, has, a, has an intention. Uh, uh, he's, he, he's, he's already written it out, how it's going to take place. We begin in Amos 3.7. Amos 3, 7 says this, Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants and to his prophets. Some translations say this, that God does nothing unless he first reveals it to his prophets. So the Old Testament is revealed with both, we, we refer to them many times as major prophets and minor prophets. And, and so here the scripture says he does nothing without revealing that plan to his servants and his prophets. The Old Testament is this, it is prophetically accurate. Now, see, we believe in this as, as, as Christians. We believe in the infallibility of Scripture. So, therefore, if it is not accurate prophetically, or if it's not accurate historically, or in any of its truth claims, then it's not inerrant. It's not infallible. But the good news is, is it is. The Old Testament is prophetically accurate. 
Now, first of all, we find this about the birth of Christ, and I've, I've read the story so many times over the uh, past several weeks. We've been teaching on it on, on Sunday mornings as we go into the Christmas season. And we learned this, that Jesus was to be born, or God's Son was to come out of the lineage of King David. Psalms, all right, the book of Psalms says this, I made a covenant with my chosen. I've sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever and will build up your throne to all generations. So God's made a promise to David that once again, that there will be somebody come from him, a seed, all right? And you could follow both in the book of Matthew and in the book of Luke. There are two different places where it gives the lineage of Christ. Both those lineages come through David. One is believed, and Matthew is believed to be Joseph's genealogy. In the book of Luke, it's believed to be Mary's genealogy. Because when you get to David, it turns just a little bit. In David, it, or in Matthew, it comes from David to Solomon on down to Christ. In Luke, it comes from David to Nathan on down to Christ. So he says, once again... He'll come from David. David is what? David is a king. And he says, and and your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. Now it also teaches us this, that he will come out of the tribe of Judah. Genesis 49.10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. That's really important. I'll point something out about the scepter. I'll say something interesting about the uh, Christmas star tonight. Something I've just recently learned. You know, I'm, uh, you know, there's all kinds of things out there about the Christmas star. I've I've listened to a guy who's uh, he was a minister, and somebody gave him that book about you know Jupiter and the <clears throat> and uh, uh, this guy becomes an astronomer in trying to answer his father-in-law's question. And has gotten the major astronomers in the world to come and and answer his questions, and he studied it, and he gives a tremendous answer concerning what that scepter is. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until the tribute comes to him. Now, notice it says a scepter. Why does he have a scepter? Because he's a king. Why does he have a a staff? Because he's a shepherd. Okay, he's the shepherd king. So, it says, uh, neither the, the uh, ruler's staff from between his feet until the tribute comes to him and the obedience, once again, of the people to his. So, once again, he will what? He will come up out of Judea. And then he'll be this. He'll be born in Bethlehem. So, once again, you follow these, these things. He's got to be of the lineage of David. He has to come up out of Judea, all right? And, again, he must, he must be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5, 2 says this, But you, Bethlehem, a Pepra, though you're little among thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to rule Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. We read from Luke. Here's the account. Now, all these scriptures were foretold hundreds and thousands of years. Genesis is 4,000 years before his birth. And so you have these prophecies concerning the birth of Christ hundreds and thousands of years before he's born, written by multiple different authors, yet it comes all to point. Why? Because there's a design and there's a plan. Now, you know the Christmas story, and it, it, it begins in the first, you know, the first verse is when a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed or really to be registered. They were taking a census so they could tax them. So both are really right. And then it says in, in, in verse 4 that Joseph also went up out of Galilee, all right, out of the city of Nazareth, where? into Judea. So he's got to fulfill all this stuff. To the city of what? Of David. Called what? Bethlehem. Because he was the house and lineage of David. 
to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Now you see right there in those, and just in those uh, first two verses there, that it fulfills all three of those things. Then he must once again be of the lineage of, of, of David. He must come out of Judea. He must, he must be born in Bethlehem. Now at this point in time, uh, they're living in Nazareth. You'll remember that Mary and Joseph were both from Nazareth. Remember the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. It also says of the house of David. And so there you have, once again, those three prophecies fulfilled in just this, in just this one glimpse. Now again, uh, you know, people will often say, well, you know, the, you know, the Bible is just a, it's just a book of fables. Some will say, well, it's, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's just the history of Israel. But no, uh, the Bible is this. It's the Word of God. It is this. It is divinely inspired. And so again, he said, if he says it, it shall come to pass. Remember, he says, the beginning from the end, and if I speak it, it shall stand. It will surely come to pass. And so here we have, once again, these three prophecies all fulfilled at this perfect time in history for Jesus to come into the earth and to be born at this time. And so it says, and so it was, while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes. She laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And so we know that they had to go, they had to go out, and, they, and uh, uh, some say he was born in a birthing cage. Uh, uh, I believe that he was born there was a, in, in the middle. There was a, uh, uh, there was a, a, a temple right there in the middle of the uh, field called Mag Mag Megadol. And, uh, and it was the place that the sacrificial lambs were cared for. And I believe that that's where Jesus was born. The swaddling clothes was the, what they wrapped the lambs with to keep them from hurting themselves. Nonetheless, he's born there. And he lays in a manger. Once again, why? There was no room for him in the inn. Then it tells us this, and most, one of the most extraordinary things concerning the birth of Christ is that he had to be born of a virgin. And we've looked at this pretty extensively the last several Sunday mornings. Uh, what a difficulty this posed for both Mary and Joseph. And so, you know, we know that the angel comes and speaks to Mary and, and says, and you're going to conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. Well, you know, that's, that's pretty extraordinary news. And it says when she saw the, the angel, she was troubled at his saying, and she considered what manner of greeting this was. Why? Because he said, you're highly favored. Blessed are you among women. And, and, and so once again, the scripture says hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, he would be born of a virgin. The truth is, it's really declared in Genesis, the third chapter, when God says, where there's enmity between her and the serpent, your seed, okay, will bruise his head. Now, not Adam's seed, but her seed. Well, there's only one way for it to not be man's seed and be her seed, and that was it for it to be divine. For, if you will, for her to bring forth a virgin birth. He would be born of a virgin. Now, these are not just, a, this is not just the account. I think most people, they hear the Christmas story. And so we're just told what happened, that Mary was a virgin. And we're just told that they just happened to come, uh, you know, uh, you know, come out of Galilee and come into Judea and they go to Bethlehem for that's of the house of David. I, we just think that that's a, you know, just telling the story. Well, it is, but more importantly, it's fulfilling the promises and the prophecies that God said ahead of time. See, these things were signs to these people. It is not like that, that Joseph didn't know what the Scripture said. Because again, when the angel visits Joseph, and he says, he says, Joseph, don't be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She'll bring forth a son. You'll call his name Emmanuel. See, he knows that Isaiah calls him Emmanuel. He knows exactly what the angel's talking about. 
And then it says this, that it might be fulfilled. The virgin shall be with child. Once again, out of Isaiah, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. Here we go. Therefore, Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. All right? So what is this? This is a sign. This is, this is for them to know that, okay, the Savior of the world is being born. This is the Messiah. This is the one promised. And so when Joseph hears this, this is convincing to him, because up until this point, he's a confused young man. I mean, he loves her, and she's told him, said, listen, I've, I've been a faithful woman. I've not done anything, you know. An angel told me that God was going to give me a son. You know, that, that kind of stuff makes you scratch your head. You, you care about somebody, you want to believe them, but, but you've never heard this before. But the angel reminds him, but yes, you have heard it before. The virgin should be with child and bear a son. Don't be afraid to take her as your wife. And the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They will call his name Emmanuel. Now again, we find in Matthew, the first chapter, verse 18. And this, once again, gives the account. And so here it is prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years before his birth. And now we're seeing the account. Now the birth of Jesus was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Remember, we've said this, we've said this numerous times. In a Jewish wedding, there's two parts to the wedding. The first part of the betrothal. It's a promise. Now you're really already married. But they've not consummated the marriage. They've not lived together. They've not slept together. They've not had intimacy together. And during that time, she's preparing herself to be the bride. Okay? It's all the buildup to the, to the consummation, to the big celebration. All right? The husband, on the other hand, he's preparing a place for her, a place for her to come and to live. This is the responsibility of the bridegroom. During this, and it normally would last a year, so during this year, this is when these events take place. Remember, it says she's betrothed. In Jewish culture, she's already married because you, you have to remember, Joseph is thinking, how am I going to divorce her? How do I put her away secretly? I really don't want to do her any harm. I'll remind you again, in their culture, she would have been stoned. All these things going through his mind. He's a good man. He wants to do right. He's terribly confused. It says the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed. I mean, it's not just promised. There has to be a divorce take place to end this. Betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child. But it clarifies it. Of the Holy Spirit. It was what is miraculous. It's miraculous. It's a miracle of the virgin birth. Now, Mary wasn't perpetually a virgin. It's not that Mary never did sin. It's this, that she was a chosen vessel of God and she'll always be called blessed. And she never had relationship before she gave birth, that miracle birth to God's son. The star of Bethlehem was, and he's very well-intentioned, and, and maybe he's right, but I don't think so after I've listened to this gentleman. This is just interesting. This doesn't change anything about salvation or anything like that. It's just interesting. It says his star, his star that led the wise men was revealed. It says in Numbers 24, 17. Again, now, this is 2,000 years before his birth. I see him, but now I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. And notice it says this. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. Notice it says a scepter, all right? In Matthew, the second chapter, verse 2. Where, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? This is, this is the question of the wise men. They've, they've arrived in Bethlehem. There's a stir in the city. Yeah. Uh, we get this picture, you know, the, you know the picture of the wise men is you got these three guys riding into the town on these camels, which was not what happened at all. There's no way in the world that you got three, three guys riding across the desert 
with, a, with, with gold and frankincense and myrrh. What they have is worth a fortune. These are gifts fit for a king. Three men are not strolling across the desert all right, with these kind of gifts. They show up with a small army in Bethlehem. When they show up, now three guys just rode into camels, on camels into Bethlehem. Nobody would think about it. Three camels came and went every day, multiple times a day. Nobody cares about three camels showing up in Bethlehem, except when it's a small army. And we don't know that it's, it's three wise men. It could be 40 wise men. It could be five wise men. It doesn't say. It just said they brought three gifts, is what it says. And so they brought these three gifts, and, and so they come and they, you know, they're, they're looking for a king. So, you know, they go to Herod and say, well, my, where is he that's born king of the Jews? For we saw, now listen to this, we have seen his star in the east. I'm, I've used the Amplified on purpose because every, transla every translation often leaves out this part because, you know, again, most translations try to be a word-for-word -word translation. And sometimes a word does not convey the full thought. Many translation, we saw his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. A fuller translation is, we saw his star in the east at its rising. Right? And so they were looking in the east, and up out of the east, this star arises. Now, so that's not how stars come on the scene. This scene up out of the east, this star arises, and we've come to worship him. Now, again, why did they come to worship him? You remember the thing we keep, I've made mention of it. We'll show you another verse in a second. They keep saying a scepter, all right? A scepter. All right? A scepter, you know, often has a round head and it has a long tail. And a king often holds a scepter. Here's a picture of a comet. What's a comet look like? All right. Now, it says this. That they followed this, didn't they? You don't follow a star. I mean, if the star's here and you're walking this way, that star's still here, and the further you go this way, the longer that star's there. But a comet, they call this uh, uh, Halley's Comet. Halley's Comet was a super comet. Right? It lasted for 14 months. A super comet can last up to two years. And so every night, this comet is traveling across the sky. But it's got a scepter. That's why they say a king was born, because they see the scepter on the end of the star. It's got to be something royal that has happened. Now, people would say, well, why did they know? Well, there's several reasons why they probably knew. There's probably several reasons that the wise men knew that, this, that there was a king, all right, born it, because once again, it rose up out of Israel. They saw it's arising, all right? So here it comes. And you, and you almost have to, you know, sometimes a, a, a comet can look like a curve, but if, you, if it rises on the same plane as the earth, it's not curved, it's flat and therefore looks like a scepter. And so as it, once again, as it's traveling now, you have to remember, they come up out of Babylon. Who was in captivity in Babylon? The Jews. And who else? Daniel. Daniel. And Daniel belonged to this group. He was also considered a wise man. And so this is the reason I believe. Now, that's, that's a matter of opinion, okay? Nobody's going to get lost or saved over that, right? It's a matter of opinion. Nobody's going to get lost or saved over it, but it makes sense. There's got to be a reason that they know. And so they follow, and that's why, that's why I believe that this gentleman's right. It wasn't a star. It was a comet. All right? And they followed it from it. This is great. They follow it from its arising, okay, until it falls off the horizon. And for them, when it falls off the horizon, where does it fall? Right over the manger. And they walk all the way to it. It leads them directly to it. Scripture also tells us this, that the kings bring gifts that are foretold. Kings, 
gifts fit for a king. The king of Tarshish and of the isles will bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba will offer gifts. Yes, all the kings will what? What did the wise men do when they saw him? They fell down and worshipped him. And all the nations, you know, the kingdoms of this world, one day will become the kingdoms of our Lord. Not in every prophecy is every part of that prophecy fulfilled in one event. But there will be a day that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord. It says, and of his Christ he will reign forever. So it says, they what? They came and they offered him gifts and they fall down before him and they worship him. And then we find this part in Scripture. Unfortunately, we find Herod's rage in the slaughter of the, the infant boys. Again, when the wise men had come into to Bethlehem and, and they said, where he is he born, king of the Jews? And, and Herod sent for the priests and... and uh, And they conferred and told the wise men where they thought they would be. Of course, when they left, the, they saw the, the star again, and they followed the star until they came to where the manger was. So they saw it on the horizon. Well, now, when they don't return, Herod is enraged. Herod is an obsessed man. He's obsessed with his own power. He killed two of his sons, fearing that they might take his throne. He was a vengeful man. He was an evil man. And Jeremiah 31, 15 says, Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in, in Ramah. Right? You know where I said it, this tower was out in the, the field? And the tower is where the temple sheep were kept for sacrifice. And you know who else is buried there? Rachel. Rachel was buried right there by the tower. So thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted for her children because they are no, no more. So from the very beginning, from his, from his, from his birth to the arrival of the wise men, that he was, and again, at, at this point, he's probably, he's probably 18 months, two years old, something of that nature. Uh, and to the point where the angel warns Joseph and they flee to Egypt. But here's, here's once again, you see God's provision. How do they survive in Egypt? Well, they've, they've got gold. And they can survive. While they're gone, while they're living in, you know, they're living as pilgrims in a foreign land until the angel speaks to him about returning. See, the, the accuracy of the Old Testament should both awaken people and convince them. Not only that the scripture is true, but the future prophecies are true. Scripture teaches us that, you know, that. Jesus will come again. Yeah. He will again arise out of the east. Scripture says we'll meet him in the air. We'll be gathered together to meet him. And just as these were true, all right, again, written what? Thousands of years, hundreds of years before they came to pass, the same is true about prophecy concerning the future. And so God is able to what? He either foresees or he's foreordained, however it might be. He's able to see down through the ages or he's able to plan these events in such a way that they come to pass. But he declares the end at the very beginning. Again, the accuracy of, of Scripture is just, is just tremendous. You have these eight prophecies concerning the the birth of Christ from Genesis all the way through Micah. 
and talk about what these these unique things that, that will happen as a result of his birth, where they're where where they will happen, when they will happen, how they will happen. And and again, no one person could fulfill all those prophecies written by so many different people unless it, there was a plan, unless there was a design. I've heard to tell this when you talk about creation, one of the arguments concerning creation, you know, some people believe, you know, that, you know, that the world eventually evolved over time and eventually, uh, you know, that muddy mess, that out of that muddy mess, out of some pool, arose a cell, the cell eventually became a fish, the fish eventually, you know, became a, you know, a wolf, a wolf eventually became a monkey and a monkey eventually became a man. Paraphrased version, okay? And I'm not trying to mock anybody. One of the old arguments about creation is this. You know, if you were walking along a riverbank and you just saw a, a pile of stones stoned up, or st piled up, you might think, well, that is unique the way the river did that. You might think that. You just saw a pile of rocks. And you might even think that if the rocks had a certain amount of design to them. You'd say, why isn't that unique? You might say, well, isn't nature wonderful? And that, would, that would make sense to me. But if you were walking along the river and their lady watch on the riverbank, you wouldn't think, well, look what the river did. You would say, there lies a watch. And you would know it wasn't an act of nature, but somebody made it. It has form. It has function. It has design. It's precise. And that is much like prophecy is. Prophecy has form. It has function. It's precise. And just exactly on time, Jesus comes into the world. He comes into the world during a time where there's a universal language. It's Greek. He comes into a time when it's, it's easier to travel than any other time in history because the Romans have built roads everywhere. So he's come at the perfect time in the course of history for the gospel to be spread to what was the known world at that time. Why? Because God's plan has, it has form. It has function. It's precise. Again, when we look at Scripture and you see the uniqueness and you see that, uh, again, the, the reliability, how succinct and how, how purposefully and how carefully that God made sure that every detail was fulfilled. He would be the lineage of David. He would be born of a virgin. He'd come up out of, uh, uh, out of Galilee into Judea. He, uh, he would be born in Bethlehem of the house of David. Again, time and time again, that a star would arise, that wise men would come from afar. That unfortunately, in, in an evil man's rage, many families would lose a, lose a child. They assumed that, you know, uh, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a very big place. They probably lost probably 20 to 40 sons that night. One would have been too many but 20 to 40 sons in that area as a result of, of Herod's rage that, again, had not been for God's foreknowledge. You know, even the going, going to Egypt, God said, and, 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 and my son shall come up out of Egypt. Well, then he does. He returns up out of Egypt, one thing after another, three, over 300 prophecies concerning the life of Christ. How many times in the scriptures does it say that Jesus did something? He said that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. He just he does it over. When he healed the sick, he said it, that it might be fulfilled, that which was spoken by the prophet. He repeats it so many times. Well, we're going to come to a close. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this time of the year. We're grateful for the birth of your son. We're grateful for the accuracy of scripture. We're thrilled to know that you've got a plan. And Lord, there were troubling days that they were living in, and we live in troubling days too. But we can know this, 
There's not anything happening right now that's catching you off guard. You've got a plan. And it'll come to pass. The end of it will speak. And we're grateful. Thank you, Father, for the giving of your son. Thank you, Father, not just for his birth, but ultimately for his death and resurrection. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you, and you can be dismissed. I'm done. And, and he just ordains it to happen that way. Well, that could be too. 